Hello, everybody. Welcome to our fourth InnoQ, to our fourth InnoQ technology lunch, the first time in English. Uh, we hope that you sit relaxed at home or at work, enjoying uh, your lunch break, also having, having something tasty to eat in front of you. Uh, Stefan Tilkov will be the only one working right now, I assume. <laughs> so uh, today he will talk about software architecture for agile enterprises. Um, before he will start, a few organizational things. Uh, chat is deactivated. Please use the Q&A at Zoom or the comment section in YouTube if you have any questions. You can ask your questions during the talk or after the talk. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, we'll go over the question after Stefan's talk. And also, Stefan will check during his talk for questions and tries to answer them immediately if, you know, if it's possible. Questions can be asked in German or English, but uh, Stefan is only answering them in English. Um, yeah. We, we don't have a, a sharp uh, cut at one o'clock. So if it takes longer than one o'clock to answer all the questions, you know, we just extend the session. Um, but of course, everyone can drop out all the time. Also, the talk will be recorded. So if you have to drop out earlier and if people come a bit later, then this is also, you know, you, you can watch it online. Okay, um, some advertisements uh, on our own. Um, like in, in soccer, it's you know the, it's always the next game is of, always after this game. So this uh, next week we have another uh, technology lunch. Uh, it will be Hannah Brinz, and she will take a critical view on service meshes. But you know, not talking about next week. I would say. Uh, enough said, and without further ado, welcome, Stefan. Thank you very much, Sam. So, I hope everybody can see me and hear me appropriately. Um, the topic of today's talk is software architecture for agile enterprises. Talk about fancy titles. That's what I, that's what I thought when I wrote this down. And um, of course, as this is a lunch, and I was told that I should basically stick within the 30 minutes, um, that were allocated to me. Um, I will make a lot of uh, shortcuts and I will, I will simplify things a lot, but I would love to have some discussion with you afterwards. So please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A. Um, I will try to keep an eye on it uh, during the presentation. I will try to incorporate your questions while I'm talking. I might not be able to do that. And as I don't have a visual uh, clue, like I don't see you raising your hand or waving frantically because I'm talking something or saying something stupid, um, you have to use the tool and I will try to manage to, to, uh, to see what it is that you're interested in. Um, okay, so let's dive right in. Um, the first thing, of course, is to get the marketing slide out of the way. So I'll keep this to below 10 seconds. Feel free to throw any amount of money at us and we're happy to take it. Um, but let's get over that right now and right into the topic, which is architecture. If we talk about architecture, then the first thing maybe should be to define what it is that we mean. And for the purpose of the discussion that we're going to have today, I'm going to give you a very simple definition. It's a fancy word for the stuff you should not ignore. So I'm not a fan of people having an architect label on their, on their business card or, you know, going around telling everybody they're the architect and they're making the decision. Um, I'm basically just using architecture and architect as terms to reflect that there is some stuff that's too important to just let it emerge and some stuff that you should actually actively consider and that you should design according to your needs as opposed to just risking it um, to, to you know, become defined by accident. That's going to be a, a reoccurring topic throughout the talk. And the topic of architecture is something that we could spend a week. We actually occasionally do spend a week talking about this and, and you know, spending a lot of time with people um, when, we, when, we, when we dive into more details. I'm not gonna do that right now. I'm going to focus on, on three things that I consider important and that we observe in our projects right now. And they come up so often that you might have seen me present uh, some of this in other contexts. 
Um, but again, I'm just simplifying a bit and trying to narrow it down to the most important things, to the things that I see coming up most of the time. Those three things are these three topics, modularization, autonomy, and end-to-end -end responsibility. And we're going to start with modularization, which is at the moment the, uh, the most important topic because so many people are considering how to carve up their, their system, their context, whatever it is they're looking at into smaller units. But to be quite honest, it has been the main topic of software architecture for as long as software architecture has existed. So I'm going to spend quite some time on modularization, and you will see when I sort of go from the from the general stuff to the more specific stuff. So um, let's start with the kind of architecture diagram that I think everybody agrees is useful. I'm aware architecture diagrams, especially if they're drawn in UML, um, are something that some people react allergically to. So I've not used UML. That's at least what I claim, although you could argue that this, this, this is a simple UML diagram. So something like this would be what you would use to, uh, to talk to other people within your project about what it is that you build and what it is that you connect to, right? So let's just assume you're building a shop system. That's your context, right? That is the, the focus of your work right now. And those systems around your awesome shop, like the ledger or maybe some HR connectivity or some archive or CMS or printshop, whatever it is that I've, that I've just arbitrarily put here, is something that is out of scope of your particular project. You will, be, you will connect to those things, but you won't build them yourself. A context diagram such as this is something that I think probably everybody agrees is useful. So let's, let's, uh, let's assume that we, that we agree on this as well and move on to the next one, which I think is a little more interesting. Now, if I dive deeper, if I drill down into this box in the middle, what I would expect to see is something like this. Of course, not necessarily this particular division of responsibilities into these six components. It could be eight or 10 or 15 or three or whatever it is that you think is useful for your, for your particular decomposition of the system. But this kind of thing is really what I would like to see here. This is something that is driven by you know, the, the business domain. It's not driven by technology. It's not driven by the fact that maybe something, some of this uses a database or that there is a shared front end or you know, any kind of technical concern that somebody who's more from the business side of things would not understand. This is basically a decomposition of the awesome shop into its highest level components. And it's a white box view of the former black box that we had in the context diagram. And you can see here that I've taken the liberty of connecting some of the outside boxes to specific things here. It may or may not be useful, don't, don't assume that I've spent too much time on this particular example. It's really just that, an example. But you will probably see connections from those outside systems to the individual modules or major components within your shop system. This decomposition, this, the, the, the result of the decisions that you've made after maybe uh, talking to others, to domain experts and to other architects and developers and the people who are supposed to build this whole thing, the result of all, all this is what we typically like to call domain architecture, right? It is architecture that is mostly unrelated to technology and tech choices. That's not 100% true, but for the purposes of oversimplify, oversimplifying things to illustrate the point, it is. This is a purely business view of things, why we call it domain architecture. Now, Again, this particular decomposition that I've chosen here with the connections that I've added now, um, that is just a, that's just an example. It could be three or 15 or whatever number of components you think is useful. But those components are of a certain type and they interact in certain ways that are independent of the, of the domain role they play. So if you look at the next level, you'll arrive at something that's more concerned with the space between those components with the rules that govern their interaction. So for example, you might decide that um, those components are actually separate services. And those services will communicate asynchronously using some sort of message bus. Or you might decide that they might communicate using RESTful HTTP, use, uh, using JSON and HAL or whatever, right? Those kinds of decisions are largely independent of the number of components that you have and of the role that you play, whether I've I've uh, separated the system into these six components or eight others doesn't really matter for this kind of architectural view. Also, the insides of those boxes don't really matter because we're talking about the connection of those things, right? We call, we call this architecture perspective macro architecture. 
this distinction has served us quite well in our projects because we can we can uh, decide what we focus on, even if it's the same people, even if it's the same person dealing with both. It's like wearing different hats, talking about different things. And it's very, very good advice, in my experience, to separate those two things quite clearly because they serve different roles and they also have different life cycles, right? So for example, you might decide that you need an extra component because you're expanding your business model. Whereas in the other discussion, in the macro architecture discussion, you might decide to do to, that you now also need, I don't know, maybe some async or some sync mechanism for, for components to communicate that you didn't need before. Those are separate decisions that should be performed in, uh, that should be discussed and decided upon in separate uh, uh, with separate concerns, probably separate meetings, separate documents, separate conference spaces, whatever it is that you fancy using for this particular stuff. And of course, there is a third dimension to the whole thing, which is the insides of those boxes, right? So maybe these are the tech choices that you make for the individual components that we talked about here. One will be built as a Ruby on Rails application. The next one will mostly be Elasticsearch with a little bit of glue card on top. Something might be a commercial off the shelf system. Something might be built using a Java, or the Spring Boot stack. Something might be some existing open source product. All of those decisions can and should be made on a component by component basis, on a system by system basis, possibly. And that's what we call micro architecture, right? So we have three perspectives on architecture. Again, I find that very useful just to structure the whole discussion. You have a discussion about the domain architecture, the decisions and how to decompose the whole system into smaller parts. You have a discussion about the overall overarching technology choices, right? What's true regardless of the individual implementation of those individual components? What's true in the long term? What kind of decisions do I make that I think will stick around for a while so that I can adjust to uh, changes internally in the or that I can change components internally without violating or invalidating the whole uh, the whole overall architecture. Now those those three systems or those three perspectives on architecture have proven useful and a sort of the ba a basic building block for the rest of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. So let's talk a bit about these things here, right? We have these we have these uh, these six boxes in my example, and if you consider the the number of decisions that even for this example I had to make, and you sort of extrapolate from that into what it is that you have to do in your project, then you will probably agree that this is quite an important decision here, right? It is something that allows you, for example, to work in parallel on those different things, right? Because you, for things to be for things to be able to to be attacked in parallel, they have to be you know parallelizable. They have to be separate things. I've decided that some people might be able to work to work on the catalog, while others might be able to work on the invoicing. I sort of imply that there will be interfaces, that there, there will be an inside and outside view of those individual boxes, so that they're decoupled to a certain degree. And from that, I conclude that this separation, you know, this carving up things into meaningful, useful, reasonable boxes is a very important thing. It is actually something that needs to be done first. I've called this here system boundaries, but I mean this in a very general, general sense, right? We're, we're using system boundaries here, no matter what it is that those boxes actually are, but it's a very important thing and you should try to address that very early on. Now, uh, I've got some questions here, so let me address them. So one question is, do you see an increased overhead to keep macro and macro architecture aligned? Now, I do think that every, every time you introduce this sort of decoupling, you pay for it, right? So nothing costs nothing. There is no such thing as a free lunch in the, in the, in the words of Robert Heinlein, Tanz Tafel, right? So you, you pay an overhead for that. I do absolutely think it is worth it. And if you consider what you typically be doing, then what I'm advocating is that you maybe separate your, your uh, the, the decisions, that the technical decisions that you make into two separate documents. Call one of them macro, call one of them micro so that you know what you're doing. You can still have only one set. I'm not arguing that you have to do things differently in every box, right? So this box that I had here sometimes leads people to think that I'm advocating that you use different technologies in every single system. You don't have to do that. You can if it makes sense for you, but you don't have to do that. You can keep it open. The important thing is that you allow yourself in the future to make just internally in those systems without invalidating the macro architecture because you will want to make changes in the long run. 
And the second question is, is, a, is it a main architecture required to define a macro architecture? Um, yes, I do think you need to figure out how many components it is, what kinds of components it is, because the macro architecture is sort of, and it's risky to use those words, um, connected in a, in, a, in a meta way, right? The, 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 the macro architecture needs to provide the necessary services for the result of the domain architecture, right? So if, you, for example, carve something up into 500 smaller components, your mac macro architecture will be very different from the one that you have if you just divide into five components. So they influence each other strongly. Okay. So coming up with a right system boundaries is something that needs to be done first. Now I sound like an old, well, I am an old architect, but now I sound like one, like one who wants to do a, you know, big upfront develop, development design work. I don't, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is at least these boundaries are something that you have to do very early on. But once you've done that, managing those dependencies just in general is the most important ongoing architectural task, right? You'll have to continuously manage those dependencies, manage the number of components that you have, evolve the architecture in all three perspectives. And of course, you can decide not to do any of that. But if you don't do that, you will end up with something that you might not have wanted, right? So for example, we have a lot of clients who have huge systems, who have systems with 10 or 12 or 15 million lines of Java code. That is not something that you want, right? That's something that happens to you, that just a system grows into that size and becomes largely unmanageable. So then you have this whole destructuring and you know, breaking of the monolith discussion that you'd rather not have because you'd rather you know, have smaller systems to begin with. So I think it's very much worth spending some time on that particular aspect of architecture. And one, one thing that I wanna drive home is this. I do think that uh, people tend to stick to one particular level of of decomposing things and they miss that, they're, that, the, that the mechanism used for decomposition for structuring should be different depending on the size of the problem that you're attacking. So let's, let's just assume that you're building something with your colleague, right? And it's a very, very small system. It's, it's completely, completely defined by you know, a thousand lines of code. You don't need any fancy decoupling mechanism to build something like that. Procedures, functions, methods are perfectly fine for that. If it grows beyond that size, if it, may, if it maybe grows the number of developers, then you need something different, right? Then you might want to have a decent module system to, to deal with the whole thing. Or you might uh, move to a real component system, right? So there, there's really some isolation between the people building a component and the people who use that component. Seems like a useful thing. And of course, these days, the whole range is microservices, or maybe it's no longer the whole range. Maybe we've, we've already entered the phase where it's kind of cool to not do microservices anymore. I'm not sure. I still like a lot of the ideas in microservices. I think they're a very, very worthwhile approach to, to large scale software architecture um, because they increase the decoupling or they reduce the coupling between things. You can evolve to microservices more separately. Is that a word? You can you can you you have a higher chance of being able to evolve them separately than you have two modules that are connected within the same system. But I also think there is a further step, and that is often ignored. That is the system boundary, right? You can make a conscious decision not to just build a single system. You can decide to build two or three or five or six systems. I'm not going to go into a lot of the exact definition of a system here, but a system to me is you know just larger and it probably includes all of its, it's not just a backend service, a headless backend service, it's probably something that includes a UI and a database and everything that's needed, it's more like an, like an application. It's a, it's a loaded word with lots of meanings, but you probably hopefully get what, I, what I'm trying to address here. Basically what I'm, what I'm advocating for with these slides is that I hate these kinds of diagrams. When somebody shows me a diagram like this, this is my system and this is my architecture, I start weeping at them, right? Because this is so generic. You can basically you just use this slide for every project ever. It's, it's pointless, it's, it's boring. It's not something that interests me and that I find useful for as, as a result of architectural work. Typically it's the next level, it's the modules that you have within that system that are interesting. And what I'm advocating it for is that maybe, maybe you should start viewing those modules as systems you know, maybe you should at the first level con consider whether or not these things should be separate systems, because then you can make conscious decisions about each of them, for example, deciding to not have the exact same stack in each of them. That I think is a, is a reasonable thing. Okay. So um, 
let me continue with um, a pattern that I think is connected to this whole thing. And that to me is also the key idea behind or the key value proposition of microservices, which is this whole idea of that your architecture should be um, evolvable, right? Your architecture should be evolutionary. And I like this pattern, I like this picture because it's sort of, um, um, it's a nice analogy for uh, what we as humans um, uh, experience as we evolve through our lifetimes, right? That the person you are now is the same person sort of that you were, I don't know, 20 years ago, just assuming that everybody's at least 20 who's listening. Okay, so 20 years ago, you were sort of the same person, but it's very likely that not a single cell in your body is still there, right? You've sort of grown and the cells have died and have been replaced by new cells. You change, you, you maintain your identity, but you change over the course of your lifetime. And that is, I think, what we should try to achieve with our architectural work as well. We should build a system or a system of systems, a system landscape that allows for evolution that does not require us to throw everything away and restart from scratch every few, every few years once stuff becomes unmanageable, because that's what slows us down. All these restructuring, rewrite projects, basically just to you know get away from an old tech stack, they, they slow us down continuously. And whatever your fancy tech stack of the year 2020 is, is going to be extremely boring and out of date five years from now. Probably everybody knows that by now. Okay. So evolutionary architecture, evolvable architectures, is something that I sh that I think we should all strive for. Let me move on to the to the next point: um, autonomy. Now consider again my diagram from from a few minutes ago. Um, if we look at this, and I sort of hinted at that, um, we can see that this is possibly something that will help us structure the project teams, right? So if this just let, let's just assume this is not a simple system; it's a bigger system that requires a lot of work. We're building stuff from scratch. We have a lot of fancy ideas here. And we actually have to throw a number of developers at that. It's, it's not a system that can be built by three people. And maybe we have a team uh, set up like this, right? We have three teams and those teams are assigned responsibility for some of those components. So invoicing and accounting sort of sound as if they were related. The search and the catalog, right? The catalog having all the products, the search allowing me to search through the products or find matching products. And maybe then the uh, authorization authentication system and the checkout and order system, they're all assigned to different teams that start building stuff. Now, what you can see as a possible evolution of the project structure of the team structure is that maybe at some point in time, we notice that the authentication authorization stuff and the checkout and order stuff are really too much for a single team to handle. We wanna bring in more people. We could all, we could grow the team, but probably there's some boundary, some some limit as to the team size that we want to maintain. Maybe that's, I don't know, seven or eight people, um, then maybe we want to split that thing. And now you can see that the boundaries that we've drawn from an architectural perspective actually end up being boundaries for team structure, right? In fact, what we're doing here is we're sort of building a team architecture view of things. And that is, I think, the, a key insight from the last few years. And again, similarly to microservices, I like to point people we're interested in microservices architecture to David Parnas's paper from 1972. In a similar way, you can see this thing here reflected in Mel Conway's work, which is also about 50 years old. So I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Probably everybody has seen Conway's law by now. But in a nutshell, it just says that organization and architecture, the communication structure within the organization and architecture are strongly related. You know, I've talked about this last week in his, in his talk as well. So we see a relation um, between organization and architecture that goes both ways. Um, and I think the key conclusion here that I wanna draw for this particular talk is that if your goal is to have autonomous teams, and that's a big if, but if your goal is autonomous teams, then the, a matching architecture is absolutely essential. There is no way for you to you know, even dream about autonomy if you don't build the architecture of your overall landscape in a way that supports that. This goes both ways, right? Autonomous teams need autonomous architecture, autonomous ar or, uh, decoupled architecture with autonomous um, isolated units needs autonomous teams to maintain this stuff. That's, I think, um, an interesting thing because it crosses boundaries, right? It's, it crosses a boundary from architecture and development to um, business modeling and to man managerial stuff, right? Like designing an organization. And that's very a very interesting thing and something that I find fascinating because as technologists, as IT people, we suddenly are involved in discussions that we were never involved in before. So I think it's, it's really interesting. Okay, so um, 
I'm reading the questions, but I'm postponing my answer to some of them, right? Because some of them would, would sort of draw me in a direction that would take too long to answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll stack some of them for the end. My second statement here with regards to autonomy is that I think smaller is better, right? I think size is the number one enemy of agility and every software developer sort of has experienced that. The larger a project is, the more people you have to work with, the slower you become, the less flexible you become, the slower, the longer it takes to get anything into production, right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that bad projects in general are bad. It just means that bad projects that have a monolithic organizational structure and a monolithic development delivery structure are bad. And I think that's pretty universally too, true. Right? So I think what we're trying to do in most of the things is try and um, find a way to carve up systems into smaller units, find to find a matching organizational structure so that we actually can be flexible and agile and fast in the small and then get the whole thing, the whole emerging thing fast as well. Right. So that is, that is, I think, a key idea here. Now, do you have to do that for everything within your company? Maybe not. We can have a discussion about that maybe later on as well. But I do think it's a, it's a very important thing. And then uh, this essentially means you need to keep your systems or your units, your, your components, your building blocks as small as you reasonably can, but no smaller. Now, with no smaller, I could open up a whole other discussion for about an hour about, about why I think super small microservices are a really, really, really bad idea, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to focus on the overall, you know, the higher level picture and argue that um, the stuff that I talked about helps you achieve this. Now, one, one thing here is the whole macro architecture and domain architecture thing to me establishes a set of rules that everybody needs to play with. I like, personally, I like, and I observe that other developers like that as well, when, uh, when developers have a lot of freedom in making decisions that actually solve the needs at hand. Right. As opposed to some, you know, ivory tower architect uh, mandating everything down to the last little decision, you get a lot of leeway to do something that makes sense in your particular situation. On the other hand, that requires that for everything to cooperate and to collaborate and to integrate, you still need some rules. And those rules are really, really, really important. My favorite analogy for that is this picture, is this mark. I love the picture because it's quite pretty. I also like it because it has... Um, all of those attributes in, in such a market here, you have restrictions as to the as to the uh, emergency uh, exits, as to the uh, fact that the that the aisles can't be uh, can't be filled with stuff, right? That every every uh, market participant has their own space, but they can decide what they sell. They have complete flexibility. They can do whatever they want with their own space, but they have to play by the rules of the whole thing. And that I think is a very nice analogy to what we want to achieve here. We want to have strictly enforced sensible rules for the macro and domain level. So there should be rules as to who's responsible for what, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. But how people do that should be largely left to them. Of course, you can limit those things with, uh, with a set of restrictions, like these are the programming languages we allow. This is the standard reference architecture everyone's supposed to follow. But you can change your mind later on and still things can cooperate. And the last ingredient that I have in my little list here on my, on my architecture views in 2020 is this one about end-to-end -end responsibility. Now, a, a pattern I like, to, I like to point to here is the idea of um, an organizational unit that is more like an autonomous cell. That sounds a little bit like a terror cell. That's not what I mean. This should be something that delivers positive value here. And the idea here is quite similar to the DevOps idea in that you need to have a cross-functional team, again, a very old idea, and that cross-functional team should have all the functions within it. It needs to actually get something from the whiteboard all the way down into production as quickly as possible. Because only things in production matter and only things in production allow you to get actual feedback about what the market thinks, what your users think about what you've built. And then you can change your mind. You get into this virtuous circle of being able to deliver things quickly and, and, and fast. Now, the idea here is that each of those teams has end-to-end -end responsibility for something. And I'm 100% convinced that if you want that, and if you think that is a good idea, then you need to have system boundaries that match that. Because if the system boundaries here did not match the team structure, none of those teams could actually deliver something on its own. It would not have end-to-end -end responsibility. You might claim it has, but it wouldn't actually have it. In this way, if each of them is responsible for a system 
in the sense of a deployable unit that delivers actual value to end users, then each of them can do their own stuff, can put their own stuff in production, and can be set up, you know, KPI driven as some as a unit that has to deliver value to actual end users. Now, of course, this is, a, this is a lot to ask from such a team, right? I'm not saying that every person has to become a full stack developer. Um, I, I do actually think there are people exist who have skills in various things. So I know a lot of people who do that. Um, I do not think that uh, the right answer to this particular problem here is to have everybody in that team to know everything because that's clearly not possible. You will have people who are focused on, on different aspects, but the team as a whole should be a full stack team able to deliver something um, into production um, and thus needs to touch all of the different aspects. Okay, so that's my that's my brief that's my brief uh, you know very quick run through through uh, uh, architectural views uh, related to uh, making things fast. And I'll conclude with a number of recommendations, and I'd like to dive into some discussion with you. So my first recommendation, and I've said that numerous times, is I think this idea of autonomous teams is a key ingredient for a lot of reasons. Maybe the, 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 the softest reason and the one that's, that's the least obvious is that it makes people happier. I think it's really, really annoying if as a developer, you are just a small cog in huge machinery and you never see the effects of your work. If you're in a team that can observe what people do with the stuff it builds and then decide that they can try out something and then see that people like it better and then and do more of that, that is extremely motivating. That is that is. That is really, really great. And that is a very important thing. I think happiness in the workplace in general is a good thing, but it also means you have motivated teams who are happy to work, who are happy to build something instead of complaining all, all, the, all the time. So whatever your role is, whether you're part of that team, whether you're one observing those, building those teams, I think it's a universally good idea to give them as much autonomy as you can afford. Of course, that means you have to manage those inner dependencies, right? Organization and architecture, might be restricted, uh, one of them or both of them, typically both of them to a certain degree, right? So it's maybe you cannot choose the architecture that you would love to be able to choose because the organization does not match what you want to do. That's okay. If you cannot change the organization, then find an architecture that matches the organization. If the architecture is a given, if that is clearly what's, what's done because it's the only, th only way you can solve things, then maybe you need to change the organization. Maybe you should be very clear of that. In fact, there are so many aspects of that that I, again, could dive into a longer discussion here. I think there are so many things like, uh, you know, establishing standing teams as opposed to project structures, lots of, lots of effects of this. You might be able to do some of them. It might be completely impossible in your particular organization and structure to do any of that. So you really have to look at the actual uh, environment you're in. And finally, create evolvable structures. I think um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pipe dream that you'll be able to you know, define the one right architecture. So it's much better to define an architecture with built-in evolvability, because that means you can still claim 10 years from now that it's the same architecture, even though many other people will say it's not, because you can basically change all the technology. Right? You could even evolve the domain architecture and the macro architecture so that almost unrecognizable, but you do so in a managed and structured way, which I think is something that we should all strive for if we're building a modern architectures. And with that, I conclude. Uh, thank you a lot um, for listening so far. I hope some people are still here. I yes, I can see some, that's very good. I also see some extra questions and I'll um, stop sharing my screen and we'll ask Sven to step in to see whether I've missed anything. So, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we still have I think five questions left. Um, so there is one favorite question of mine. Um, do you still maintain your opinion for don't start with a monolith? Um, hmm. This uh, famous, uh, let's say, blog post on Martin Paula's uh, page. Because from, from experience uh, of yeah. the, the, the person asking um, in enterprises that, uh, sorry, from my experience working in enterprises, they are not like startups in agility. So a modular monolith to start for me make, makes much more sense. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, so to give some context, there was an interesting discussion that, that I had um, uh, and Martin Fowler was kind enough to let me write a, you know, sort, of, sort of a counterpoint to his post and publish it on his own blog, which I think is, is a very cool thing. Not, a, not the least because it allows me to do some name dropping, but also because it's very cool, I think, of him to have those two opposing viewpoints there. And also, I think, shows that this is not 
something that can be can be answered that simply. Now, uh, I actually advocate for monoliths a lot of the time. For example, if a startup, that's a good example, if a startup wants to build something very quickly, I strongly advocate to build a quick monolith and not to waste time with building something that is scalable to a degree that you have no idea you'll ever achieve, right? So be better build something very quickly, get some market experience and then rebuild it from scratch, start again. So I'm not at all in favor of never doing a monolith. I'm perfectly fine with doing a monolith in certain occasions. Um, the one thing I do no longer believe in is exactly the idea that you can build a modular monolith and later turn it into a set of microservices or self-contained systems. Because if that were possible, if the monolith were so modular that you could easily turn it into a set of separate systems, then there is no point of turning it into a set of separate systems. Don't bother. It's fine. It's perfectly okay. Typically, systems over a certain size don't end up this way because the dynamics of the actual structure developing them, the people developing them, the teams developing the whole thing, they actually will end up building something that isn't as modular as you'd like to believe. I think it's a little bit like saying, well, instead of using a debugger, couldn't we just build software without bugs? Well, yes, you could. And please do, if you can do it, just go ahead and do it. My experience is, that if you don't have the structure set up so that people can step on their toes all the time, if you don't set this thing up this way, then you will end up with something that is not modular. And maybe one other thing to add, I do think it's really, really hard. And that I think was the original point of Sam Newman's and Martin's view on the uh, start with the monolith thing. Um, it's, a, it's very, very hard to come up with good boundaries if you don't know the domain. So if, it, if this really is the absolute first system that you build, then you're highly likely to get the boundaries wrong in your domain architecture. So maybe it's a good idea to start with a simple thing, gain some experience and do that. Many people who have a monolith problem have a very, very big system and have lots of domain experience. They've spent decades building this particular thing that they want to get rid of. And the really last thing they should do is start building a new monolith. I think they should start by reviewing their own experience because they will come up with a very, very good domain architecture that's maybe composed of five, seven things. And then you can build those seven things so that they don't become a huge entangled monolith again. That's, that's my view. OK, thank you. Um, we have two questions which are slightly related, I would say. Um, and they are about the uh, architecture being also organizational work. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's not about only about technology, but uh, if you define macro architecture, it means reorganization, um, refactoring organizations. The question is, is that true? Um, do we need as domain architects or enterprise architects become business consultants? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's basically uh, the, 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 the question. And another question is similar. Um, yeah, do we, do we need to, we have to include the, the, the business and the whole company if we, if we want to do that? Right. So maybe to address the first part, I think that uh, the domain architecture absolutely needs to be a collaboration between tech people and business people. Um, I think tech people alone can't do it, but definitely business people can't do it alone as well. So it's, it's some, some organizations I've seen, and maybe the name choice here is unfortunate, I've seen domain models, you know, like enterprise architecture domain models that, that te were, tem were attempted to just, or that, that were created within, within the attempt to be a purely business driven kind of thing. And that meant they did not create um, systems or units or boundaries that were reasonable from a software engineering perspective. I do think you need software engineering expertise and knowledge to help people design a good domain architecture because there are many things about coupling and cohesion that are not typical business concerns. They're technical concerns. Doesn't mean you understand the domain well enough. So maybe talk to somebody who does. Maybe you do understand the domain well enough and you can do it on your own. But I do, I do see that as a collaborative effort between business people and technical people. Um, it needs to be done together. And it might lead to some reorganization, right? If you do it on a company level, on, a, on an enterprise-wide level, then you're, in the, in the, then you're absolutely opening up these kinds of discussions. And maybe that's inappropriate for an organization, right? 
it's a smaller organization, much easier than if it's a bigger one. If it's a traditional company that's been there for 100 or 200 years, then that's going to be really, really hard. And you might, be, might want to be very careful about this thing. If you're applying it on just a system level, just for this one particular thing, then it's maybe mostly just you know structuring the system into slightly more independent parts so that you can have a better project development um, a team set up. That's doable without changing the organization, unless you're talk we're talking about the project organization, right? You'll change the team setup, the responsibility of individual teams, but you don't necessarily have to change the overall organization. That's kind of a question of the level on which you apply those things. Um, and um, the second, what was the second question? Was it related? Help me again. And you're muted. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so basically it was related in a sense that um, that we as architects need also to convince uh, business people yeah. of the value of what, oh, what yes. we are doing, that we create this, these autonomous cells. Yes, I've actually found that not to be too hard, interestingly enough, right? So if I, if I met with resistance, it's mostly by, um, by existing um, IT team or department leads, right? Because it violates some of the tailorism that's been introduced in the last few decades. So if you have, if you have a structure that has a clear separation between operations and development and a very clear process that says, this is how we put something that's been developed by the development unit into production, right, this long uh, process, then it's a little hard to convince them. If you talk to actual business people who have a need, then they all, you know, once you tell them what we're, going, what we're trying to do is we're trying to address the fact that you have thousands of feature requests that are not being worked on because everything takes way too long. And our only goal is to get a feature request quicker into production. Business people typically love that. They also like the idea of having a small connected unit where, you know, somebody with with responsibility can deliver something without having to sync with tons of people. That's modern organizational principles. It's not too hard to convince people. Again, that's an overgeneralization. It might be very different in any particular organization. And you might want to pick your battles and decide whether that is something you want to, you want to address or not. Um, okay, thank you. Um, in an enterprise, how would you envision an ideal process for defining the macro architecture? For example, the CTO with, meets with some senior colleagues every couple of weeks to talk about architecture evolution. Mm -hmm. How would the autonomous teams be integrated in such a process? Right. So again, the typical consultant answer is it depends. Right. You'll have to you'll have to adjust your your approach to the organization. Um, so um, uh, I've seen things that work where uh, there was like a, you know, from, from each team, there was somebody who went to a meeting once a month and sort of represented the, the team's ideas and needs and, you know, problems they ran into and new ideas they had about technology, technological things and suggested this should, should be part of the macro architecture. And then the sort of, they sort of agreed in, in the meeting to do that. I've also seen people who did that using... Um, using a more centralized structure where there was a small team, like an architecture group that sort of defined things and discussed them with people. And I've seen any mixture of those things. I think it's in general, a good idea to have some like, you know, editorial um, responsibility. I think it's, it's pretty tough to completely distribute that evenly and do it like a, you know, like a complete democracy. I, I'm a little skeptical of that. I think you need to have somebody who makes the last decision, somebody who's responsible for the overall macro thing. But they should be very careful and restricted um, in what they want to standardize and really limit themselves as to the absolute minimal amount of stuff that needs that merits being standardized, as opposed to standardizing everything around uh, around you know every aspect of that stuff. Okay. okay. Um, would you would you say yes to the? to the statement that the development of the macro and micro architecture alternating iterative tasks because the choice of a technology inside a box affects the space between, um, there is no between. Yeah, it's the space between, between the boxes. Makes sense. Yeah. Yes, yes, that absolutely makes sense. So um, yeah. I think there are decisions that are local and should stay local and should never be exposed to the outside world. And I think, um, a lot of the times these decisions will be very obvious. It's like a decision whether I pull in a library or something, whether, whether I you know, incorporate some tool for this particular system because it, you know, 
deals with only an aspect that's relevant to that particular system. As soon as you, as you come to the boundaries, when you have something that, uh, that uh, is related to an interface or something that's related to the communication between two or more systems, that becomes a candidate of, uh, of being incorporated into the macro architecture. Right? And once you add something to the macro architecture, the micro architecture typically needs to do something to support that. So let's say you decide that um, you like this fancy, I don't know, um, JSON REST hell stuff. You want to do hell uh, as of data format on your REST interfaces. You haven't done that before. You've now decided that's an excellent idea. That each of the micro architectures, because you might have multiple micro architectures, each of them will need will want to support hell somehow. So you'll, you'll have a need for you know, maybe a library or a set of best practices or patterns to deal with that particular stuff. So there is a continue, continuous, uh, continuing influence between those two things, one influence the other. There's also an unhealthy thing that could happen. So one, one example would be, let's say um, you make a technology choice and that technology choice enables you to do something at the macro level. So for example, you could, you could easily serialize um, Java objects in some proprietary binary format because you have a fancy remoting library, but that remoting library only is available for Java. So now you've made Java, if you decide to adopt that for communicating with, between systems, now the choice of Java is suddenly part of your macro architecture. Maybe that's okay because you decide well, we'll use Java today and we'll use Java next year and 10 years from now, that's fine. That's all we're ever gonna use. But maybe it's not good because you say, well, maybe I want to go with Go or Scala or Clojure, whatever, right? Or, or Rust next year. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to say what, what my favorite programming language is five years from now. So I'd be very careful um, to put restrictions in the macro architecture that limit my own decisions five, five years from now, right? So it's a good idea to view the, the macro architecture, not as something that enables diversity between the individual systems, but rather as something that um, protects you from future you, or the other way around, right? Your future you does not want to suffer from a bad decision present you made. And that's, that's why you put so much effort on having the macro actually a little looser so that it can incorporate diversity within the individual systems. Thanks. Yeah, our, our future us will be uh, yeah. happy with that answer. <laughs> mm. um, uh, if you have an organization where you can't have a real autonomous team, uh, for example, you can't have ops people, for example, in the team, what kind of architectures do you think would adjust better for new systems? Right. Um, so, uh, of course, there will be lots of lim limiting factors in your organization, right? So um, that's a good example. Let's say you're in an organization where a DevOps is not going to happen, right? Because that's not the structure this particular team does then it's really hard when I mean, you can argue like you're, and until you're blue in the face about the, uh, about the fact that you would prefer a DevOps cross-functional team, but if it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, right? So um, you, have to, you probably have to restrict yourself um, and to adapt your macro architecture, that's where it has the most effect to uh, the needs of the organization there, right? So uh, the same could be true in other environments where it's maybe, uh, you know, it's a given that you're deploying onto this particular cloud provider or um, that's the, you know, it's a little sad, but that's maybe the web sphere environment that everybody is, ha has to use. So you'll, you'll adjust to that. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a limit that's then sort of the, uh, the, uh, the common denominator for everybody involved. And you'll have to deal with that and maybe accept that and try to fight other meaningful battles as opposed to that. I do think it's a problem. I do think it's a problem if um, not necessarily if the, de if the development of ops boundary um, exists, it could be fine, but then the ops team really has to give you a lot of automation and a lot of self-service to um, sort of connect to whatever it is they're offering, right? So maybe you don't have complete authority about what you do. Maybe it's a very well-managed cloud environment of some kind, but you at least have maybe a well-managed CI CD pipeline that allows you to connect to that stuff and to get something into production or maybe a sign off. That's another example. Some organizations um, for regulatory reasons or compliance reasons, there is no such thing as a development team deploying into production. There is no way to get something into production unless somebody with the necessary authority has signed off and that this thing has been documented and tested according to those guidelines, whatever it is. If you're in a structure like that, then you only get as close as possible to this ideal, right? It's, 
in general, it's always easy for me or for anybody who does a presentation to present this as the only truth, which is of course not true. I mean, there was a lot of gray between the black and white here and you'll always have to adapt it to your organization. Right. Thanks. Um, most of the examples uh, for SCS, for self-contained systems architecture, are web shops, as in your presentation. Hmm. Also, most real-world references are from web shops. Uh, do you think this is only a coincidence, or are self-contained systems especially useful in these domains? Would you use it also in other domains? I would definitely use it in other domains, although I would not use it everywhere, right? I mean, it's, it's always a risk if you're, if you're associated with a term like that, if you talk about it a lot, like, like uh, myself and a lot of our colleagues do, that it seems like you, it's, this is your hammer and you're, you're everything, everything is turned into a nail because you have that hammer in hand to beat it down. And that's not what I think. I don't think that it's a good choice for everything. But for a lot of domains, it is. I think the reason that there are so many web shops is because everybody knows what a web shop is, because everybody orders stuff on the web these days. That's the main reason. It's easy. It's an easy example. We have other examples um, that we occasionally use. Um, for example, we, uh, for a long time, we used something that looked a little bit like the LinkedIn or Xing clone as an example for doing that. Um, we do a lot of DDD related stuff where we talk about bounded contexts, which very strongly, the, the size of a bounded context is very strongly related to the size of a, of a self-contained system. Uh, we sometimes use finance examples here. Our colleague, Michael Plug uses um, uh, a credit rating um, example for doing that. So I think those are all valid things. I think SCS is a good strategy and a good architectural style. If you're doing, if you're building um, if you're building custom software, if you're doing individual software development with larger teams. It's not a good style if you're three people, then it's, it's better to build something else. And it's not a good thing if you're not building, you know, uh, something that's on the web or, you know, that has, that has this model, right? If you're building something that's running on a mobile device or that, you know, that, then it's a, or that's a standalone desktop application, obviously it's not a good choice. But again, it would be sad if it were, it would be kind of weird if anybody claimed that this is the one architecture to rule them all that is the best choice in every case because no such thing exists. It works very well specifically if you have a team size from say like 10 to 150 people, you need a way to structure things, you, do, you, want, to, you want to give teams end-to-end -end responsibility, then it's something that we found to work very well in various domains. Thanks. Uh, one thing you mentioned uh, was that I think the, the ivory tower, and we have a we have we have a question, you know, in, in that direction. I would tower. say uh, it, it's not about the ivory tower, but it goes in, into this direction. So, can you speak about the challenges of architecture becoming a bottleneck to application development? So, mm -hmm. some architectural decisions cannot or should not be made quickly often requiring uh, research, experimentation, proof of concept, team education, and so on. It's important to get these decisions right, yet there is often opposing pressure to deliver working software and show tangible yeah. results. Yeah, very, very good point. And I think um, anybody giving an easy, easy answer to that would be probably uh, uh, you know, selling you snake oil. I think there are many things, uh, there are some things you can do about this whole thing. One is you can distribute responsibility for various things. Not, not, no single person has to decide all of those things, right? So likely if you're a larger organization, you have different people with different skills and knowledge, and some of them could just you know, take over some, some capability. So you don't have to be, um, that's a stupid analogy, I'm thinking of you know, lieutenants, that's what they call, I think call them in the, in the Linux world. I don't like the military analogy here, but in general, you, know, you, could, you don't have to be the one ruler who makes every decision, you could sort of distribute responsibility across various people. Secondly, you can decide, um, you can make a very conscious decision to limit yourself to the absolute minimum amount of decisions that are in your hands, right? I mean, some things should be uh, on that level, like maybe you have, maybe you've set up, this is our security policy, right? This is our data privacy policy. This is our cloud policy. This is, you know, how we do things. Now, once you've written that down, it doesn't have to be a huge document. Probably once you've written that down, a change to that document 
uh, can't be done by everybody because then what's the point of the document, right? You'll have some sort of process. Let's bring that up in the next meeting or maybe open an issue and I will consider it and, you know, make a decision and then we will change the rules, but we won't allow everybody to, you know, make a decision that we're now, whatever, we decided not to send data to the US and now somebody says, well, I, but I want to, and then does, that doesn't work, right? So you have to, you have to, whatever the decisions are that you think are very important at that level, you keep them in sync. And um, the last thing maybe is that um, you don't have to get everything right all the time immediately, right? You can live with a sort of in-between state. Like, you know, maybe you're eventually, your architecture is eventually consistent. It's maybe it's okay. They do something quickly right now so that they can gain some experience. And then you sort of um, decide whether that is something that should change your overall architecture rules or that you want to incorporate in your, in your rules in general or something that needs to be done differently. Of course, it's hard. I'm aware of that. If something is already deployed and in production delivers value, it's really hard to say, well, yeah, it is, but it doesn't match our architecture, so we, we need to change it. Um, so again, it's a, it's a matter of, of the organizational culture, of the structure of the, of the organization, of the communication path, the trust you have in people. If you have very good teams, you can trust them to make good decisions, probably. If you have rookie teams or if you don't trust your external vendors, when stuff like that is, is in play, then you have to somehow adjust things accordingly. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question to autonomous teams. Uh, would you say that uh, to be more autonomous, you should not use shared libraries for technical aspects, which should oh, okay. behave the same across systems? That's a, that's a very interesting question, right? So. Um, Yes, I think most of the time I would argue that code reuse across autonomous teams is bad, basically because that's the position that needs to be argued for, right? So um, it is a critical thing because you become dependent, very dependent on something that is not visible on the interface, right? You have this shared, shared thing. And we've had that happen in numerous projects where somebody developed a useful library and soon enough people depended on the same version of that, of that library being deployed in all the systems. So once a change was made to that library, everybody was required to update at the same time, which essentially means you have a distributed deployment model. So be very careful of, about that. On the other hand, what you can do is you can share code in the same way that people share code in the open source community. You can have a library where there are useful things that people can use or not use, and they have their own update strategy. They, they update whenever they feel it's necessary, they switch to something else. Nobody is forced to use a library, but they can use a library. And maybe there are multiple libraries for multiple environments. As long as that is the case, I'm perfectly fine. One of our clients actually decided to uh, mandate the rule that every library that somebody wants to reuse across boundaries must be open source. That's an interesting strategy, sort of uh, ensures that you're not doing that to business code, only technical code, because everybody's really reluctant in open source and business code. And it also meant it was very well documented and people had sort of a little, a little bit more of a boundary uh, that, that sort of stopped them from doing that with every piece of code, but only with something that they found really valuable and thought was valuable enough to be published as open source. Okay, yeah, thanks. So uh, one thing I, which came to my mind was uh, try as the enemy of the decoupled <laughs> when it comes to uh, that's it. Yeah, I think, yeah. So the, the, uh, the wonderful James Lewis coined the term that, you know, uh, I'm designed for replacement, not for reuse. I think that's a, that's a very nice, nice idea, right? Build things that are, don't ever get so connected to anything that you're not willing to throw it away and build it again from scratch. If that's a general rule, if that's something that limits the size of things, then you're much more flexible and easier. It's much easier to uh, evolve in the long run. Um, another wonderful question, I believe. Uh, do you think that a person who defines architectural rules should at least theoretically be able to implement systems that follow <laughs> these rules? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. At least, at least, uh, at least theoretically, that's, that's a lot of leeway, right? So yes, I definitely think that should be the case. Maybe, you know, alternatively, maybe they can do it together, right? Maybe there's a group of people with different skills, maybe not everybody has to do everything, but yes, absolutely. If those architectural rules are defined by somebody who never has to suffer through applying them, if, you know, or never had had to, that's that's really tough. It's gonna be, it's not gonna be fun. 
And I think that's, that's maybe in line with a general view of mine. I think um, as architects, we're absolutely responsible for, for selling our stuff. I think architects are architects work in marketing. Right? They, they might not like it, but that's what they do because they have to market their ideas. They have to you know, convince people that it's a good idea because if you have to rely on, on some you know, organizational power that, that gives you authority to enforce a rule, you've basically already lost. You'll have to have good ideas, convincing ideas, and you have to be able to convince people that they should at least try them, apply them, give you feedback and how well they work for them. If everybody thinks your architecture is stupid, they will find ways around it. So uh, it's a good idea to keep that in mind. All right, thanks. So to close the session, um, if no new answers come in uh, in the next seconds, there were two questions uh, regarding references. So where can people find more on this? So uh, yeah. for example, uh, architectural uh, granularity, you know, where, where can I read more about macro micro architecture? What are the blogs, the papers, the books? Yeah. Um, also evolving structures uh, over yeah. time. So what would you recommend? So um, first of all, there's a lot of material on our website. We have a, a whole number of talks on the topic, some with some overlapping stuff to what we talked about today, others highlighting different aspects. Um, I think we, we wrote an article, um, Philip Gadi and I wrote an article, it must have been 12 or 13 years ago, that's probably the earliest reference to our use of the terms. Um, and there are numerous articles as well on the website. Basically every article we write in other media is cross posted to the website as well. So you can find them as well. Uh, there are numerous podcasts in German and English um, as the presentation materials. Also there are video recordings of talks in German and English. There is no book. There is no you know, authoritative, authoritative reference that says this is this particular view. I'm sorry about that. Maybe we should do one. But uh, to be frank, that's not on the agenda at the moment. At the moment we're basically uh, distributing that knowledge or that experience and those best practices through talks and articles and podcasts and other media. All right, thank oh, yeah. you. Well, let me, excuse so, me, uh, Sven. Yeah. Maybe two things. We do we do have a habit of creating little websites, little microsites. There is one. There's one called scs-architecture.org, and there is one called isa-principles.org that both uh, cover some of that. So um, they use the terms and they define them to uh, in a little more rigid fashion. And they're also collaborative efforts. So for example, the SCS architecture site now has commits from various other people, not all of which are our clients. So there are a lot of people using that, those ideas and applying those ideas without giving us money, which is perfectly fine. That's why we created it this way in an open way. And we would be really happy to hear from you. Uh, to, uh, we're really interested in your definitions and comments and critique and criticisms uh, about this stuff. We really want to see this as a community effort as much as possible. All right, cool. Yeah, I saw Robert uh, pasted all the links into the chat uh, on ISA principles and SCS architecture. Yeah, so all questions are answered. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for the presentation and uh, giving the answers. And also thank you very much uh, to our audience. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I wish also everyone a, a great day and see you next week with uh, Hannah Prince talking about, oh, we'll take, you know, she will talk about the critical view on service meshes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.